Hi, everyone. Okay, I like to talk with my hands, so I'm possibly going to be moving around a bit. Um, so yeah, this talk is going to be a little different. So I saw the schedule and I saw who was going before me. So I thought, oh, this is fantastic setup for me. So I don't have to worry about talking about some of the other stuff. So that was nice. Um, but really, we're going to be thinking about some of the ways we look at viruses in different ecosystems, especially in soils. So going to this review, which was either seemed like yesterday, depending on your pandemic years or years ago. Um, we think there's 10 million to 10 billion viruses per gram of soil or virus-like particles, things that we think are viruses, right? And in this complex ecosystem, arguably the most complex out there, we have so much going on and we're trying to find these viruses in this ecosystem. Now you would think with 10 million to 10 billion, we would be raining viruses. They would be everywhere. We'd be happy with what we know about viruses, but we're not there. So the issue is the main approach in which we look at viruses has been metagenomes, which is extracting DNA right from the environment. So doing a review of the literature, we can see that actually less than 2% of our assembled reads actually go to virus context. So we actually don't get to see the majority of the viruses out there. Arguably, we're seeing the viruses that infect the most dominant hosts, but does that mean they're the most abundant, or sorry, the most important? So we really want to look at viruses, but there's this low resolution because there's all these other organisms in the way. So one way you can get around this, something that I've been working on, is doing a viral targeted metagenome, a VLP metagenome, a virome, which is instead of direct nucleic acid from the environment, we actually are going through a series of a resuspension buffer, physical desorption to get those viruses off that soil, purifying and concentrating the virus particles, and then sequencing those. Now, using this method, depending on how you amplify your DNA, you can get single-stranded and double-stranded DNA viruses. So here we get this increased resolution on our viruses. We can even get ultra-small microbes, which is really cool. But the problem now is that we don't get the host information. And we love viruses, but we also want to know what they're doing to their host, how they're impacting the whole ecosystem. At least that's what I care about. So we kind of want to do both strategies. So one way we can take advantage of this, of stable isotope probing, is where we can decrease the complexity of our samples by looking at specific ones. Now, I will be looking at the ones that are active, but you can take your isotope of choice whether it's 13C, 15N, to look at the pathway that you care about the most. So I'm using heavy water, which I'll talk about in a little bit, because from previous work by Steve Blazewitz, we know that in soils, most of the microbes are actually inactive at a single time point. So when we're sampling with this metagenome, you're getting arguably everything that's there, and then you're describing it, and you're thinking, okay, whatever we see the most reads for, that's the most abundant, or that's what's important for this ecosystem. But it may be that that organism's not even active at that time point. It could have been a week ago, or they may become active in a minute or an hour from now. So when I use stable isotope probing, what I'm talking about for heavy water is not deuterium. It's H2-18O. So we have the enriched oxygen. And we like to add this to dry soil. It's something that aquatic people have to be jealous of, right? We can add water to soil. It's hard to add water to water. So in this situation, Water is a universal substrate, and 18O gets involved in DNA synthesis. So the 18O gets incorporated into the DNA backbone. So we can look at activity, we can look at DNA synthesis and growth and mortality. So what we did before was we actually showed that you can apply this to soil. So this, these weren't dry soils before. This was actually Arctic peatlands, which we added heavy water, and we were actually able to track microorganisms growing in sub-freezing temperatures that were anoxic over a year and label their viruses as well. And I have a cool little diagram up here that I adapted from a collaborator, Daria at JGI, where we actually take a labeled sample and an unlabeled sample. So in this case, it'd be natural abundance water or heavy water. You incubate your samples. And then the organisms that are active are the ones incorporating the, the ATNO into the DNA. So we can physically separate their DNA based on their density. And you care about the ones that are unlabeled as well because there's all this genetic diversity and they may become active in a week, in an hour, in a day, right? So we sample and we sequence all of that and you compare those fractions. 
But by physically separating them, we're decreasing the complexity and we can look at specific organisms, right? So we have inc possibly increased um, resolution on our viruses and we have our host information as well. Okay, so now what I'm doing currently. Hopland is a field site that's about an hour and a half to two hours, depending on how fast you drive in Northern California. So in the semi-arid and arid environments, we have this summer drought. Now I'm originally from Arizona and I thought, oh, it's hot here. This is crazy, right? How are organisms survive in the desert? Desert's extreme. We don't have this. This is great for tourism. If you wanna to go to the beach, you know it's not gonna rain. But how are these organisms surviving and coming back once the water comes back? What's going on there? We really need to be looking into this. So I'm part of a science focus area that's led by Jennifer Petridge at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So it's a cool little diagram depicting all the stuff that we're doing to really understand these communities, how they're surviving the drought, and what happens after we have that first rainfall, which is what we call the birch effect. So this was described in the 1980s, where you add water to a dry soil, and you get this burst of microbial activity. And with this, you get this large, this mineralization, this pulse of CO2 from the soil. So we care about it because we wanna see what is the fate of the carpet in the soil? And is this something we can work with, we can mitigate? How are the microbes surviving here? What, what are the different responses? How much carbon is actually lost or how much is actually brought back later on? So to build upon this with my grant, I took this California grassland soil. I had pre-wet and then I added water or heavy water and I sampled one, two, and three weeks. So we don't have space, we don't have habitat change per se, but we have our time component here. And then we took advantage of our water there, and then I also added the phosphorus. So maybe you can include this with our habitat component. Now, why would I have added phosphorus? Well, in a report that um, led by Noah Sokol of our group earlier this year, we saw that really how a microbe dies affects the microbiome. Not all death is created equal. And when a virus kills a microbe, it disproportionately takes phosphorus out of the necromass that's given to the community. So it's pulling P out. So it's messing up the stoichiometry that we think organisms and activity is needed within soils. So I wanted to take advantage just to see, are we getting more virion production, viral particles in the soil ecosystem? Are we having increased infection rates from viruses? What is going on? So when we look at viruses, as Arvin alluded to earlier, there's so many different types and we are totally biased. We're going in, we're sampling with metagenome. We're like, this is the virus sphere. This is everything that's going on. When really we're just getting double-stranded DNA viruses. And then we're like, oh, the virum, this is better. We have increased resolution. This is the solution. Well, then we're ignoring everything else that's going on. So with our metagenome, bulk or total, and then we have SIP. So this is what I collected for our experimental design. You get your microbial information, your viral information, and you get insights into activity. Then we added the metatranscriptome to really compare for gene expression and getting the RNA viruses. Then there is the virome. So originally it was just bulk virums, but I'm happy to say that we now have SIP virums, but I'm not gonna be talking about those. So this is really getting the increased resolution on viruses and then actually labeled virus particles in the environment and describing what does that mean and comparing lysogeny versus the end effect of lytic infection, which is the virion in the environment. And then a novel thing I decided to do when we were building this was to finish the kitchen sink here and look at eDNA. And I was so happy that there was a question asked earlier because I was nervous that I was gonna say this and people were like, what is that? We don't get it. Okay, so for anyone who didn't get it, environmental DNA, exogenous DNA, relic DNA, ancient DNA, free DNA, naked DNA. It's all the same thing different terms, right? It just means the DNA that's in the environment. Why is it there? What is it used for? So many different ways. We know microbes will use it for building biofilms. We know it's there when they die. How long does it persist? What's its exact origin? How long is it remaining? And what does it go on to do? We just don't know. What I wanted to do different here is if you look at studies that look at this relic, this ancient, this free DNA, they typically will take a metagenome, and then take a metagenome that's modified to remove it and say, ah, here's what changed. We took a different approach where we sacrificed our hands and our muscles to push it through a 0.02 micron filter. 
after a virum approach to actually look at the eDNA itself. So this is not removal of eDNA, this is analysis of the eDNA. So what do we get? We sequence way too much stuff. Um, so yeah, this talk I'm gonna give you is gonna be a portion of the story. And that's a portion of a portion of what's actually sequenced. Um, Cause there's a lot that still hasn't been sequenced and there's stuff that's sequenced, but I can only do so much time. To, um, I have so much time on my hands. Luckily I was able to steal Grant for the summer from Joanne Emerson's lab to help out with this. He didn't have enough time either. So I'm gonna be hopingly stealing people in the future. But this is like the slew as describes our kitchen sink. So imagine your household, you're looking at your dirty dishes. This is me taking a snapshot of the dirty dishes here and then really trying to bring it all together. So I'm plugging Grant's poster again. It's been plugged twice now. So that means you really have to go to it. So he does more of an in-depth characterization of the eDNA, right? We're still figuring out what that means. And just a preview, DNA, the eDNA sucks. It's highly degraded, it's dirty. I had to go and say sequence it. And they said, oh, are you sure? And it said, please. And I threw money in sequencing that. And then I had to sign a waiver and then they finally did it. So that's, that's how crummy it is. Um, He's also starting to do this preliminary comparison of this kitchen sink, specifically to our viruses from a bulk virums and then our stable isotope probing virums as well. So I'm gonna focus specifically a little bit on the eDNA because this really excited me and it's a step away from viruses, but I'm gonna bring it back to viruses. So in this figure here, I try to make it very rudimentary for everyone to understand. We have the y-axis, which is your environmental DNA. The x-axis we have pre-wet, so dry, one, two, and three weeks post adding water. The first thing you should see is the dry soil has a ton of this eDNA in it, right? So whether this accumulated the whole summer or happened right before I sequenced, we have no idea. So that's something we're actually investigating. You'll see after one week, we have almost a 60% drop in our eDNA. So something's happening. A week later, we have a small increase. And then a week later, we have another drop. So going through with what we had, so this is totally preliminary. And next week, I might show you something totally different. That's fine. Um, I don't work that fast, so not next week, maybe a month. Um, we really wanted to understand how this would look at our micro microbial populations and our viral populations. And some of it, we had sequenced and some of it we didn't. So also leverage the historic data from the Hopaloon field sites. We have over 20 years of, se or 30 now, sorry, 30 years of sequencing at the Hopland field site. Okay, so I'm gonna confuse your eyes here. The y-axis moved to the secondary y-axis. Now the primary y-axis is microbial and viral DNA, right? But the x-axis is the same. Green is still our eDNA. Blue is our microbial DNA. These are microbial populations and yellow is our viral populations. Above it is what I made up to interpret this. It could be wrong, but it's on the screen so you believe it. Um, so the eDNA is possibly accumulating over summer. We haven't sampled, so we don't know. Then we see this balloon, this burst in activity of these microbial populations and the sharp decrease in eDNA. We also start to see the viruses taken off as well. We're teasing into data to see, are those viruses taken off outside of the cell, like in the virion population or whether it's in the host because the hosts are doubling. Then a week later, we see the viruses taken off again, but now the microbial populations seem to be crashing. And then we get a small amount of eDNA added. So what I'm interpreting is we have this huge loss because the microbes are eating those. Like, this is delicious. I love this. I'm happy I'm eating it. And then we had a small increase because the viruses were killing the microbes and that was accumulating in the environment. Then a week later, I don't even know what to think about this. We have the microbes kind of leveling off, the viruses kind of leveling off, but then this dramatic drop in eDNA. So where is that going? Wish I had another time point. So for now, it's the community is stabilizing. Okay, I moved on to thinking, I thought it was microbial, it could be viral. What is the origin of cDNA? So we have our viral populations on the y-axis, microbial on the x-axis. The dotted line is x equals y. So left side is viral, right side is microbial. Blue dots is eDNA. We map the reads to the organism or the biological entity. This shows that most of the eDNA is microbial related. So if we think that the microbes are eating the eDNA that came from them, they're cannibals. So these are sick creatures. Um, and then whether the eDNA is accumulating or persisting, we don't know, but it's definitely serving as a priming agent for these microbial populations, right? So 
the previous population, whether they believe or not, are giving to the future generations. That sounds cool. And then some preliminary data, and this is what I'm going to end with, is that our samples that we have the phosphorus added to, that we were looking at the eDNA, there seems to be fewer reads mapping to the viruses. So maybe that they're intact virions, so we'd have to really look into those viron viromes that we had. Is it that they're making the host hardy so the hosts are not exploding? More coming soon, hopefully. Okay, so doing a final acknowledgement. This is such a huge team and I have so much data and everybody's looking at every aspect of this ecosystem. So this is such a great team to be part of. So uh, Mike Allen up there, fantastic. I hired him as someone to work with me on this project. And he's really helped me push this out. Everyone at JGI has really helped, especially with the SIP viromes. That's something I've always wanted to do. And we're finally getting it done. The SFA team, as it's slowly evolving over time, um, I appreciate the recent awards that we won to help sequence everything. Now, if only there was awards just to pay someone to process data for us only, that would be great. Um, and then Joanne Emerson and Grant Gogol for coming this summer, helping out and keep doing work for me. <laughs> I, I do wanna do a land acknowledgement for Hoplin because this is such a great field site the native communities have really helped take care of it. And it's so nice that when you go out there, not only do we have the Berkeley people who manage it to take care of it, but the natives are there. And if, you, if there's something that's not recorded, you point to it, they have their personal data. They know what's going on. They've taken such a good job taking care of this land. And we appreciate that we're able to work with them. All right, thank you, Gary. I think we're going to do one question from the online chat, if that's good. Okay. Um, do you think it's a true drop of eDNA or could it be that the added moisture allows for an organic matrix to flourish that basically holds back eDNA on your filters and therefore preventing it from ending up in the filtrate? Yes. <laughs> so I, as we learn in biology, you know, those people that can do a lot of computation stuff, they have the hardships too, but there's nothing like going in the lab, doing something and it fails or you bias it, right? So this approach for eDNA, we're pushing the sample through a 0.02 micron filter. I am biasing what I'm seeing for sure. If anything was collected on something, it wasn't coming through. And then we have the soil and the eDNA stuck and entombed in all these small pores. And we're adding water to that. Are we creating this, these micropore spaces too and they're clinging on? Absolutely, because we did not super saturate our soils, right? So if anything, we could be the ones inhibiting it as well. Um, all I can say is I'm gonna keep doing more work Hopefully it's believable and publishable and people like it.
Okay, and with that, uh, let's just thank all the speakers from this morning again, um, especially because we are almost on time, which is amazing, really amazing, almost on time. Um, now it's time for lunch. We will resume at 1.20 with flash talks from posters, you know, one minute, science going everywhere. You will see structures, you will see ecology, you will see genomics, you will see everything. So be back at 1.20 for like the third and final set of talks. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. And we will start this afternoon with the Flash Talks, but before that, a word from our sponsor, kind of. Um, joking aside, this is uh, more of an announcement, but one of the things JGI organized um, used to be every six months. Uh, it's been a while since, you know, you know what. Um, but we are resuming this microbial genomics and metagenomics workshop, MGM workshop. Uh, so what is that? These are week-long workshops for um, anyone interested in learning more about everything genomics, the kind of genomics JGI does. So, you know, exploration of novel diversity, comparison of complete genomes and metagenome data, integration of like viruses and microbes, things like this. So anything you can think of in terms of what JGI products uh, are and, and what we offer our users, we try to cover all of them in this one week workshop. Um, Nico said, is there a date? Oh yes, there is a date, sorry. Uh, January 30th to February 3rd, this time in 2023. The uh, registration is open at this website, mgm.jgi.doe.gov. And this will include again, not just you know, microbial genomics and metagenomics in a broad sense, which means IMGM for microbial genome, IMG VR for viruses, the not yet official, but almost there IMG PR with the P standing for plasmid, if anyone is curious, um, plus the gold database, which uh, basically hosts all the data, you know, information around the genomes in a sense. Um, anything else? We're good? Perfect. And with that said, we will start the flash talk with Alice Soren. And you have to come here because you have my. Um, hi, everybody. Speed's not necessarily like my strong suit, so please yell at me if I'm rambling. Um, but my name is Ellis, and I'm here temporarily working on a short project with Simon. Um, a lot of times when you're using a prophase identification pipeline on a bacterial genome, they have a little bit of trouble uh, differentiating between true bacteriophage genomes and these phage-like elements that look basically identical, so it makes sense. Um, these types of elements are a lot of times the phage tail protein, which can be co-opted by the bacterial host um, for things like bacterial defense. So they kind of use them to stab other bacteria, um, signaling, also adhesion. And what we're doing is trying to leverage the fact that when we look at the orthologs from these viruses and the orthologs from the host and compare them, um, we do find that they have a lot of overlap in vertical descent. And so hopefully we'll be developing a pipeline to kind of quickly differentiate between the two. So this is still in its infancy, so definitely come talk to me, ask me questions, tell me about problems, things like that. Thank you. I will actually emcee this from the side. Um, maybe, not sure. I can see this time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like yours, so yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm... Vanya, you can't see that. Um, I'm a grad student in Andy Fire's lab in uh, Stanford. Uh, I have a poster about um, these really weird RNAs that I've noticed in human gut metatranscriptomes um, that kind of fold into these weird long needles. Um, there's no corresponding DNA reads that I can find. And they have no apparent homology to any database that I've tried to look in. So they're completely just unknown stuff. Uh, and they encode these proteins that AlphaFold thinks folds into well-folded domains, but again, there's no sequence or structural homology that I can find. So particularly exciting is that I've managed to find um, positive samples with, in collaboration with the Bart Lab at Stanford, and so I'm now starting to study the, whatever these are in, in real life as well. So please come to my poster if you're interested in hearing more about these and how I found them in the first place. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Oh, here we go, it actually works. Yeah, next is Morgan from Lisa Duhames now. Hi there, I'm Morgan, I'm from the University of Michigan. I work with Melissa Duhame, and I have a poster today about the evolutionary patterns of global ocean viral genes. So I, my plug here is the methods, and then to find out the results, you need to come talk to me at my poster. Um, so Tara Oceans is the data set that I'm using. I'm using the, part, um, the free living fraction that have been binned by Tom Delmont. And I have these mags here, metagenome assembled genomes, which um, are not clean for viruses. So I've mined out those viral contigs. And I've used this to create 
um, through, a, uh, through read, read mapping um, and uh, converting nucleotide sequences to amino acids, I have these population consensus sequences that are viral, and I map back these individual reads, and those represent variants in the population. And I'm using these variants um, as single codon variants to determine evolutionary patterns in these functional genes. So if you're curious what um, viral genes might be under negative selection or positive selection or neutral processes, I'd love to talk to you about what they are. Thank okay. you. This is killing me. Okay, here we go. Hello, uh, I'm Jan Finke from the Hekai Institute and UBC in Vancouver, in BC. Um, we've lately been working more and more with um, marine metatranscriptomes, not only so we can study all the different viruses simultaneously, but also to get a feel for the activity in samples. Um, to better analyze these short sequences in metatranscriptomes, we built a deep learning model to classify sequences into either pure prokaryote or eukaryote or one of the four viral realms. We applied that model to samples were taken off the coast of British Columbia, um, up there at Calvert Island. And together with a homology based approach, we could then um, confirm uh, a range of viral families in the samples from all the four viral realms and could get the activity across samples, sampling month, sampling depth, and some of them are also varying with uh, environmental variables. And then additionally, the deep learning model also um, predicted a bunch of, uh, well, thousands of uh, putative novel viruses. And the model is uh, accessible and available. <laughs> Thank you. Next is Christian from Drones Lab. You, you may recognize the style. Yeah, yeah, I'm Christian. I'm from John Emerson's lab. I should, have, should have put my name in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I have a poster about what happens when you take very dry soils and then you add water. That might sound like a deja vu. So if Gary convinces you about why it's important to ask that question, come to my poster. Um, I would also say that this study in particular is a good example of how tracking uh, viral diversity you know, can improve your well-being and just restore your mental sanity as a microbial ecologist. And that's because sometimes uh, when you're tracking viral composition, uh, you can actually reveal ecologically relevant dynamics that are lost with other methods, right? And to convince you about that, this is just a quick look at some of the data. This is a heat map from the same set of soil samples. The up one has uh, we extracted total DNA and profiled the bacterial community composition. And you know, the main point is that there's no pattern. But if we take the same soil samples and we perform biromics and we track the composition, there is a very clear successional trend. So if you're interested in that, come talk to me. Thank you. I also do not put my name on my slide. <laughs> I'm Julia Brown. I'm from Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Um, and my poster addresses a question that has sort of been presented in different environments through all these this morning's talk, what is the state of infection within the DNA itself? Um, and so I asked the question, what is the state of infection with DNA virus and epithelial viruses within epipelagic bacteria, marine bacteria virus? Um, and so the data that I'm using to um, look into this is single cell genomics data, um, where we've sorted individual cellular particles, um, amplified the DNA within them and sequenced them. Um, and this is advantageous because not only do you see genomic DNA, but also associated viral DNA and other stuff. Um, and so I, we applied this technique to samples from around the globe, uh, 12,715 cells total. Um, and so come to my poster to find out how many cells are infected by a virus. <laughs> and also to talk about the process of finding viruses and the other stuff that comes along for the ride that is also interesting to look at. Thank you. And last but not least, Leila. Hi, uh, my name is Leila Boucheri. I'm a PhD student in Lisa Ziegler Allen's lab at Scripps. And I'm ex super excited to be here today to explore some hydrothermal vent viruses with you all. Um, samples were taken from three different vent sites, including an off axis background control and used to generate our DNA and RNA samples so we could really explore the meta omics down there. Um, Viral contigs were identified using multiple tools, including Deep Beer Finder, Beer Sorter 2, Check V, Vibrant, which we could also get a clue of some auxiliary metabolic genes down there as well. 
VCONSAC2 was used to generate this beautiful viral population network. But probably most excitingly is we saw presence of RNA viruses down there. This is pretty cool because to date, to my knowledge, there have been no RNA viruses um, reported at this type of environment so far. So if you're into vent viruses or any kind of extreme environments like I am, please come see me at the poster session. Thank, Thank you. you. This was awesome. No offense to any other presenter, but I love the flash talks. And, and these guys were perfectly on time. So thank you so much. You are amazing. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Joan or Antonio. I will set up this a bit back here. And yes, good. That's the one too far. Oh, I can do this too. I can uh, myself. You can do it. We can, we can do it any way we want. Anyway, I mean, we are here for the talk pretty much on the intro. Uh, but like I said this morning, for anyone who wasn't here, I'm super, I was, and I'm still super excited about the three keynotes of like three big pieces of viral ecogenomics that I'm really interested in. And, and Kim is somewhat here beyond the amazing work to also represent everything we can do when we do look very deep in the model and try to characterize molecularly what's happening. And that takes a lot of effort and time, and you can't do it necessarily do this at scale, but it's usually absolutely amazing. And so with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers and for everybody sticking around after lunch. So uh, Simon introduced this morning that I'd be leading off you know, a virus host interaction kind of session. And I would say, you'll see my talk is probably more about virus conflict with other mobile genetic elements. Of course, this all happens within the realm of the host cell, and we indeed, we indeed care about the host cell, but it's really conflict between mobile elements that I'll be talking about today. All right, so my lab thinks about lytic um, bacteriophages specifically. So these are viruses that engage with specific receptors on the cell surface, inject their double-stranded DNA genomes, and then elaborate a very wonderfully orchestrated transcriptional and translational program to take over the host cell machinery, replicate their genome, and assemble structural virions, which house newly replicated genomes. These new progeny viruses can go on to, of course, replicate or to uh, lyse the cell and release into the environment to in infect and kill neighboring cells. So this, of course, imposes a tremendous um, selective force on bacteria, and bacteria have to evolve mechanisms to defend themselves against viral predation. And for those of you that have picked up any journal recently, you're probably inundated with diverse mechanisms of defense. So I'm gonna overly simplify this incredibly complex field right now with this very simple cartoon. So bacteria can acquire genes that um, render them resistant to viruses. By and large, we are starting to see a pattern that mobile um, genetic elements confer phage resistance. So they are the things that are carrying these cargo genes that give the bacterium the resistance against a given virus. These can manifest at the level of the cell surface, but by and large, these mechanisms that block phage attachment come with fitness costs for bacteria. So they, by and large, cannot um, change their cell surface to, to adapt to viral predation because those surface molecules are required for their life some, in some other aspect. So really, most mechanisms are kind of at the intracellular level. Once the phage DNA gets into the cell, these defense mechanisms can adopt many different mechanisms. Some you will have undoubtedly heard about, things like CRISPR-Cas and restriction enzymes can act to degrade the viral genome before the replication program is initiated. If the host cell does not have such a defense or the virus can evade it, then it will continue its um, attempt at replicating in the cell. And there are a plethora of mechanisms that have evolved to sense the um, viral infection and ultimately lead to an abortive infection phenotype, which results in the single infected cell dying in response to viral infection, which is not good for the single cell, but it's good for the population, of course, because the virus cannot complete its replication cycle and the neighboring cells can survive. So this is incredibly overly simplified. You know, 15 years ago, I think we knew about less than five or 10 mechanistically distinct defense systems, and now we're upwards of, I think, 70 at last count, which is probably grossly out of date by last week. Um, and so this is really amazing emerging field when it comes to diverse mechanisms. Um, my lab is primarily 
we're definitely interested in molecular mechanisms, but we really wanted to look at a model system in which we could really deeply understand what defense systems matter to a given bacteria in nature, right? By just looking at sequences, we don't know which is actually on, which is engaging with which viruses, which viruses a, a given bug is encountering, right? Most bacteria harbor many defense systems in their genomes, and it's really not clear kind of hierarchy exists if one dominates over the other, et cetera. So my lab set out to really set up a model system to study these dynamics from a, a clinical point of view. So we study Vibrio cholera, which I'll get into in a moment. We, um, we isolate samples and we study these samples over time. And a couple of the key things that I'm gonna hit on today that are in this theme of phage defense are we really want to understand, you know, knowing that these phage defense systems are often localized to mobile genetic elements, how did the biology of the mobile genetic element contribute to phage defense? And how do they disseminate these traits to new hosts, right? So we're very interested in that. And I'll tell you a story about um, one of our favorite ones today. And that has a very clever way of disseminating to new hosts. And then we're also very interested in discovery of phage encoded inhibitors that undoubtedly drive the diversification of these defense systems in nature. Um, but we, as a sort of we globally in the field, you know, we have a pretty limited handle on phage encoded inhibitors compared to the many defense systems we have cataloged. The one exception I would say are CRISPRs and anti-CRISPRs. It's very clear from, from that beautiful work that the diversification of CRISPR-Cas systems is driven in large part by these amazing phage encoded inhibitors. And undoubtedly, those same kind of parallels are at play for all of these other mechanisms, but we don't have a good handle on phage encoded inhibitors, oftentimes, in my opinion, because people study these systems in heterologous hosts, heterologous hosts with phages that are not really encountering those defense systems in nature. So they haven't had the pressure to evolve inhibitors. All right, so to establish sort of a model system, we focus on Vibrio cholera as our bacterial host. So this is um, an aquatic um, facultative pathogen, so it can live freely in aquatic reservoirs, emerge to cause disease in humans following the ingestion of contaminated food or water. So in that niche, it causes watery diarrhea, which helps it disseminate back into the aquatic environment and facilitates its travel back into um, other um, individuals. It's been known for a long time that phages are, of course, associated with Vibrio cholera. Lytic phages are associated with Vibrio cholera in aquatic reservoirs, no surprise to this audience. Um, but we also know that these phages must be co-ingested along with their bacterial host into individuals because we find a subset of these same phages in stool samples of cholera patients, right? So this is a scenario where Vibrio cholera is attempting to replicate and cause disease in a human host is being inundated by phages that are attempting to kill it. And we hypothesize that those strains that are ultimately most successful must have ways of defending against viruses in order to help them um, continue to flourish in that niche. We also think that this is a great model system for studying mechanisms of defense or phage um, resistance that could be at play in other clinical environments, right? We don't see the evolution of phage resistance at the level of cell surface receptors because all of these phages use essential molecules that, that the Vibrio host needs to colonize the small intestine. So you don't see loss of those receptors, you see intracellular mechanisms of defense. All right, so the other sort of half of this, of course, is the, the phage that we study. And this is sort of a very intriguing observation that I, that I started to make as a postdoc that is still continuing on now that I have my own lab. I had a set of samples as a postdoc that was collected over a decade long period at a hospital in Bangladesh. And they were cholera patient samples. We knew they were phages in some of them, but nobody had really cared enough to look at what those phages were. And as a phage biologist, I really wanted to get to know the phages in the system. So I started isolating and characterizing, sequencing them. And I kept finding basically the same phages over and over again. Um, and I assure you it is not phage contamination. <laughs> Um, and so this phage I called ICT1. I named it for the first phage that I isolated from this hospital, the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh. And I expected to catalog hundreds of these, but I pretty much stopped at ICT3 because the diversity within cholera patient samples is extraordinarily low. 
We've now um, sequenced many of these phages from patient samples, primarily in Bangladesh, also in India and in Africa. We found the same phage in these locations. We now have phages collected that are highly similar between 1992, our oldest is from India, all the way through current on this um, particular uh, genomic map, it's just through 2019. So these are individual ICP-1 genomes that are stacked up um, each concentric ring is a genome. They're color-coded by location and organized from the oldest to the most um, recent. The outermost ring represents the um, genes that the phages encode, and they're colored by whether or not they're conserved or not in all of these isolates. So some of these isolates are remarkably conserved, even among the most temporally isolated samples, so over 25 years apart. We have isolates that share over 99% nucleotide identity over 75% of their genome. So huge core genome here that's highly conserved. And that, of course, encodes things that we can actually predict function for, which is not always easy in phage genomes. It includes DNA replication machinery, structural proteins, things like that. And then there's a large swath of genes here, for example, where you have gaps in the alignment. Some phages have these genes and other phages do not. And what we're coming to realize is that these sort of variable components of the phage genome, by and large, represent counter adaptations to changing and fluctuating defense systems in Vibrio cholera. So these phages don't hang on to counter defense inhibitors or defense inhibitors unless they're confronting these defenses in Vibrio. And the defenses in Vibrio, there's some stagnant ones in the genome that we see all the time, but epidemic strains do vary and they do um, sort of fluctuate their defense systems. So we can use this collection of phages to our advantage along with these Vibrio strains to study sort of co-evolution of what has happened in nature. So the idea here is, is pretty simple, right? We can take our collection of phage and our collection of Vibrio, and we can ask, okay, well, if bacteria from the future are resistant to phage from the past, then they have acquired some resistance trait and we can, we can attempt to find it. Um, and these are all tractable, so we can use a lot of genetics and a little bit of bi biochemistry to delve into mechanism. And then similarly, we can take phage from the future and ask, can they now plaque or overcome those defensive barriers that once existed? And indeed, we find evidence of that. So that's sort of our, our system to study coevolution. Um, and I'm gonna start off by telling you about sort of one of the favorite mechanisms of antiphage activity that we discovered in my lab that's encoded in epidemic strains of cholera. So this is where it really gets to a story about competing mobile genetic elements, okay? So the element I'm gonna tell you about is the phage-inducible chromosomal island-like element called PLE for short, because that's too much of a mouthful. The phenotype of a PLE-positive host is very striking. So here's a bacterial lawn in gray. If you take a PLE minus strain and you drop tenfold dilutions of phage, you get these beautiful black spots or zones of clearance, which are plaques representing successful infection. If you take an isogenic host that has this element, which is 18 kilobases in length, about 25 open reading frames, no obvious antiphage activity, totally blocks plaque formation. It's even more impressive when you do burst assays, you see that the phage goes from making 90 infectious pro progeny in 20 minutes under laboratory conditions to zero. And you can never get escape phages under laboratory conditions. And it will become hopefully obvious why as I explain how this works. So as I mentioned, um, when I first discovered this, the really the only identifiable kind of hallmark gene here was an integrase, a hallmark of mobile genetic elements, but that was kind of it. Um, and I'm going to kind of show you the punchline and then go through some of my favorite mechanisms. The punchline is that PLE is a viral satellite or a parasite of this virus, ICP-1. It resides integrated in the chromosome. It is induced to excise and replicate upon phage infection. It inhibits the phage through many mechanisms, and I'll explain a few in my talk today. It inhibits it, but precisely so that it can actually steal structural proteins that the virus is otherwise making to house its own genome. And it instead incorporates its own genome into these particles and then spreads that genome um, from infected cells. So the net result is that this MGE, the selfish mobile element, gets to spread as a result of phage infection. And it's also beneficial to the host cell population because the individual infected cell produces no lytic virus. So the surviving, the cells in the vicinity can survive, okay? 
So this is a defense mechanism as we view it from the cellular point of view, but it's also really conflict with another mobile genetic element that's driving this. Um, this sort of relationship is sort of adequately described or very nicely described, I should not say adequate, very nicely described by this quote by Eugene Kunin, a parasite's parasite saves host's neighbors. He wrote this quote in describing an analogous system, um, which is in a totally different domain of life. So giant viruses are parasitized by these virophages and these giant viruses infect their protist hosts. And these virophages help to mitigate or dampen down the successful infection by these giant viruses and help to protect the cellular host, right? These types of interactions of sort of viruses of viruses across domains of life have been studied in, in plants and in, in humans with hepatitis B and hepatitis Delta virus. And they're well studied in bacteria, um, for example, in the context of Staphylococcus aureus, which is the cell on the bottom, which um, have uh, Staph aureus pathogenicity islands, which are conceptually similar. They start integrated in the chromosome, a phage comes in, they are induced to steal the structural material from that phage and then spread those pathogenicity related genes to other organisms. So these interactions exist across domains of life. They're hard to identify, right? These satellite viruses um, are not related to the viruses that they parasitize. So it can be hard to predict who's the host to the virus. And you need a compatible tripartite system to study these on a molecular level. You need a susceptible cell, you need a susceptible virus, and you need the right parasite. And as I'll show you, there's antagonism, of course, between the virus and this parasite. So there's mechanisms of defense occurring at that level too. So you could miss these interactions by just pairing the wrong things together. Um, it's starting to become clear in bacteria that there are many unrelated families of these satellites. The pleas are one of them. Um, and there's some other gram negatives and, and gram positives as well. And these have emerged independently. They use functionally distinct mechanisms, but they've converged on sort of similar strategies. It's really amazing. All right, so let's get into some of the detail here. Um, so as I mentioned, plea resides integrated in the chromosome. Upon infection by ICP1, we know that PLE excises. We knew, or we thought we knew, that this was a specific interaction. We don't see the PLE responding to unrelated viruses. Um, and my first graduate student discovered that this is because a phage encoded protein that's produced early in infection um, called PEX-A actually binds and interacts with the PLE encoded large serin recombinase, which is an integrase whose job it is, is to facilitate the excision and integration of the plea in response to specific cues. So this allows the plea to excise in response to phage infection. Um, the plea then initiates its replication cycle by stealing replication machinery from the phage. The phage attempts to replicate. So everything you know, early in infection is kind of proceeding almost normally. Um, we discovered that the, during infection of a plea positive host, an essential transition before um, that the virus DNA has to make during replication, which is from bidirectional theta replication um, to this rolling circle mechanism is blocked by PLE. So many double-stranded DNA viruses have to initiate this transition so that they can create the concatamers that are packaged into the virions, okay? So this is an essential step for packaging. We knew that this was blocked um, during um, PLE positive infection and we initially hypothesized this is because the plea is stealing replication machinery. The plea replicates to nearly a thousand copies in 20 minutes. It's astounding. And so we thought just the fact that it's stealing the, the replication machinery from the virus makes it not available to the virus and it can't transition. It turned out not to be true. This actually occurs even when the plea does not replicate. Um, so we set out to sort of discover what this mechanism could be. And we used a deep sequencing approach um, and observed that the viral genome was actually being nicked or cleaved at specific sites during infection in the presence of plea. And we identified a nickase encoded by the plea that actually targets the, the phage as it's trying to transition to rolling circle replication. We named this enzyme nix i So it cleaves the, the phage genome right at sort of the transition time point. It's precisely expressed at that key time point. And this is sufficient to block the phage from, from forming new progeny. So this is just one mechanism that it's on its own is totally sufficient. 
I will add that one thing that's very um, interesting about this enzyme is that we don't understand how pea protects itself from this enzyme. We know that it's a site-specific nickase, but actually if you clone that site onto the plea, it is resistant to activity by that enzyme. So that's um, sort of a mystery. All right, so all the while the phage is attempting to complete its life cycle, part of this stage of the life cycle involves producing structural proteins that it is attempting to use to package its own genome. At this stage, the plea recruits those proteins and instead packages its own genome into these plea-like particles or plea phage-like particles. So these are housing the, the plea genome. And I always forget to say this critical piece of information, which is that everything in red is plea encoded and everything in blue is phage encoded. That would have been helpful five minutes ago. Um, but regardless, what happens at the end is that a plea encoded protein along with phage encoded proteins mediate lysis of the bacterial cell. This actually happens a little faster than the phage would otherwise program it to be um, by virtue of this membrane protein the plea encodes with I. This, um, these plea particles then can go on to adopt the same receptor requirements and host entry mechanisms as the phage. So they simply bind to Vibrio cholera and they can effectively inject the plea genome, but the plea is not capable of carrying out a complete viral life cycle. It doesn't have all the genes that it needs to do that to kill the host. And so what it does instead is it uses that same um, large serine recombinase integrase to integrate into the host chromosome at a specific attachment sequence um, using a cognate attachment sequence on the circularized plea genome to give you a plea positive recipient um, that can go on to survive, of course, because there's no virus being produced. So this cell um, can survive, the plea genome persists, and should it encounter ICP-1 in the future, the same reaction will occur. So if you've been playing sort of um, close attention to the cartoons, you will, you will note that these virions not only contain the plea genome, but they look a little different, and that's very much on purpose. We knew um, early on from electron microscopy work that the plea is packaged into modified virions. So the plea does not encode a complete suite of structural proteins. So these virion proteins are coming from the phage, but it's manipulating how they're assembled to its own benefit. Um, and so you can see this here for the EMs. You can see that the capsids here are really tiny compared to ICP1's capsids. Now the plea genome is only about 18 kilobases. The phage genome is about 120 kilobases. So this is a mechanism by which plea can force the assembly of small capsids to restrict the packaging of the phage genome. So even if the phage manages to evade the, um, the nicking endonuclease, you can actually get only incomplete phage genomes packaged into these smaller capsids. So this is another mechanism that by itself is inhibitory. And a graduate student in my lab has been looking for um, the mechanism of how this works. And through a series of genetic and biochemistry experiments, we've narrowed it down to a single protein that we call TCAP. And this protein for TCAP makes tiny capsids. So it's necessary and sufficient for the plea to drive the formation of small capsids. And we used um, cryo-EM on um, capsid intermediates that are referred to as procapsids. So you can just in E. coli express capsid proteins and the scaffold protein, which directs the assembly of the capsid. If you take the ICP1 proteins, you can make um, procapsids that resemble what you would expect from the virus, which eventually builds a T equals 13 capsid. If you co-express the scaffold TCAP from plea, you get these tiny procapsids made in E. coli, so it's sufficient. And beautiful cryo-EM data shows that indeed this scaffold is an external scaffold that basically forms a cage-like structure around the assembling capsid to restrict its size. Okay, so this is the mechanism by which PLE uses to modulate capsid assembly. So I've told you a series of mechanisms that we know are each inhibitory on their own. Um, DNA replication is inhibited, capsids are remodeled, it makes lysis go a little bit faster and the, and the phage suffers from that mechanism. These are just three mechanisms that I've told you about. It turns out that if you knock out all three of these mechanisms, the plea is still inhibitory. <laughs> turns out that if the plea doesn't excise or replicate, it's still inhibitory. So we know of at least two other mechanisms of single gene products that are sufficient to block the phage. Okay, so what this means from the phage's perspective is that it's being attacked at several different stages of its life cycle. 
it is impossible, as far as we can tell, both in our hands and in nature, to evolve mutations that allow for escape of each of one of those components, even though individually, if you express a single um, inhibitory protein, you can just get point mutations that stop the interaction. So actually, when you express TCAP, the scaffold, you get suppressor mutations in the capsid protein. This helps us figure out how these things work. But in nature, we don't see any evidence of that occurring. So then this sort of brings me back to how I started the talk, which is thinking about, OK, well, Vibrio can resist the phage, and we have this collection of, of phages over time. It must, the, the phage must have evolved mechanisms to overcome the plea in nature. And could this contribute to the diversification of pleas that we may see in nature? And I haven't told you that we do see it, but I'll explain it. Um, and so we take advantage of our phages again to understand how phages may overcome these mechanisms. And so I'll tell you about um, three distinct mechanisms of how ICP1 copes with plea in nature. And uh, I should have started with this, but one question is like, does it need to? This is a mobile genetic element. Maybe it's not in all strains. Maybe the phage doesn't encounter it that often. So a big part of our work is, um, is surveying Vibrio cholera genomes. We are engaged in collaborative efforts to collect Vibrio from endemic regions, sequence those strains, and understand what genomic fluctuations are, are we're seeing. We also, of course, mine data to look for the presence of elements we're interested in. This is our sort of more recent analysis of about 3,400 Vibrio cholera genomes that are collected at the, as the early 1918, I believe, but they're all clustered here because you can see there's only like 10 genomes. <laughs> but of course, we're getting more and more genomes as time goes on. And then we asked how many of those um, strains have plea, and then what variant of plea do we see? So you can see here that pleas are somewhat persistent, but dynamic, right? So there's usually strains that are, are presumably epidemic strains that don't have plea. But at a given time, you can see that the population can be dominated by plea positive strains. We also see a pretty interesting dynamic where a given plea variant will circulate for some time. It could be sort of rarely for a, a year, it could be a decade. And then we tend not to ever see it again. It disappears and we don't see it circulating. Instead, we see it being replaced by a new variant. So on the right hand side are just sort of the color codes for each of the 10 plea variants that we've described. And I'll show you sort of towards the end about more specifically how they vary. But a message I want to get across at this point is that broadly, these mobile elements are mosaics of functional gene modules. So what this means is that a given plea will always have the necessary components to mobilize in response to phage infection, to manipulate packaging of its genome, which is an area I didn't talk about, to replicate in response to phage um, infection and steal that replication machinery to assemble these modified virions and genes that include genes to help lyse the cell. So they all have the same components. They're all in the same order. But the identity of the proteins executing these functions varies across pleas. And this gives us a hint. Why would pleas need to encode different variants of the mobility module when they respond to the same phage? Why vary it? Right? Same with the replication. And our hypothesis is that this mosaicism is being driven by counter adaptations or inhibitors in the phage. So if the phage finds a way to out, outdo this replication module, a different replication module has to be selected for. And I'll show you our evidence for that. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, three mechanisms of counter defense that we've discovered. Um, the first one is actually what led me to discover plea, and that is that some ICP1 isolates encode a fully functional CRISPR-Cas system. So this is highly unusual for viruses, and um, the phage basically makes use of a multi-component type 1F CRISPR-Cas system that um, has spacers that match protospacers in the plea genome, that elaborates the system early in infection, Plea still excises in response to infection, attempts to replicate, but is quickly degraded by the action of the CRISPR-Cas system. And this allows the phage to gain the upper hand and once again win in a plea positive scenario. Now, we knew from um, our genomes, you know, CRISPR-Cas is kind of a, a big part of the phage genome when it has it. It's about eight kilobases of a 120 kb genome. So it's a big chunk of the genome to dedicate to anti-plea defense. 
And not all strains of the virus have CRISPR-Cas. So one of my former students set out to ask the question, how do phages that do not have CRISPR-Cas counterplea? And one of the beautiful things about microbial genomes and viral genomes in particular, they organize things for you so nicely. So in, instead of encoding CRISPR-Cas, phages instead can encode a single standalone anti-plea nuclease. So they either have CRISPR or this anti-plea nuclease. So why did we think this was an anti-plea nuclease? The answer was because um, this nuclease, which we called an origin-directed nuclease, which I'll explain why, or ODN. So this phage-encoded nuclease has an N-terminal DNA binding domain that's about 40% identical to the replication protein of the plea. So it mimics the replication protein, the N-terminus of this protein. We had a crystal structure of this. We knew this was the DNA binding domain of this protein. And my student had already showed in a previous um, publication that this protein binds to the origin of replication at discrete sequences referred to as iterons. So instead of um, just the DNA binding domain and a C-terminal, presumably replosome recruitment domain that allows the plea to steal that replication machinery, the C-terminus was a very obvious endonuclease domain. So we hypothesized from this very simple architecture of this protein that it would actually produce a protein that would localize to the plea origin of replication and then could cut that origin of replication. And so we showed this genetically and we also showed it through purifying the ODN enzyme, a catalytic dead version of it is incapable of cutting the origin of replication in vitro. If you add the catalytic active variant of this enzyme at increasing concentrations to a PCR um, product derived from the origin of replication, you get cleavage sites that precisely map to where those iterons are in the origin. And if you delete the iterons, it's no longer susceptible to cleavage. So this was a really cool mechanism, um, but of course, it sort of begged the question, well, if this is so good, and it really is very good, it's a small enzyme, totally blocks plea replication, presumably because it targets right at the origin, um, the phage can win with it. Why encode CRISPR, right? Like that's a really complicated thing to do when you could just encode this. And the answer is fairly, specific, or fairly um, simple. This is a site-specific nuclease by virtue of the fact that it mimics this one variant of the replication module. So pleas that encode different replication modules, such as um, these pleas that I'm just schematically showing you with the green module, they encode a rep A protein. They have the same C terminus, but the N terminus of the rep A protein that they encode is variable, and they encode a variable cognate origin of replication. So the rep A protein and the origin has to be compatible, but as long as a plea has a compatible replication module, it can replicate. So what this does is that this gives these pleas a selective advantage. They're no longer susceptible to cleavage by this origin-directed nuclease because it simply cannot recognize that sequence, right? So this gives us a clue that maybe this origin-directed nuclease has provided some of the selective pressure, perhaps all of the selective pressure, um, for pleas to adopt variable replication modules in nature. The next mechanism I'll talk about is sort of hot off the not yet press. Um, this is another mechanism um, that we just described. We don't understand it fully. It's very interesting, but it started with a similar observation. We had a phage that did not have CRISPR and yet could still overcome certain plea variants. And it started with the observation that it could successfully replicate in the face of plea two. So we discovered um, through a series of genetic screens that this came down to a very small protein that we named ADI, and I'll explain why we call that ADI in a moment. Um, we showed that this ADI protein is necessary and sufficient for this um, phage to antagonize the plea. It's a small protein of unknown function, only 147 amino acids. And unlike ODN or CRISPR, there was no predicted DNA binding activity and no nuclease activity. So we were a little bit stumped at how this little protein could presumably achieve the same sort of mechanism? How could it precisely attack and degrade this, this replicating competing genome? So what we decided to do is um, go after, again, one of our favorite approaches, which is just deep sequencing during infection to look for evidence of um, cleavage of the plea and perhaps at specific sites. So was the plea being targeted for degradation and was it being targeted at precise sites? And so what, to do that, we compared um, an infection where the plea was allowed to replicate unperturbed 
compared to an infection where the phage encoded ADI, we looked at ratio of the coverage across the phage genome and then mapped particular locations where we saw evidence of cleavage dips or dropouts that represent sort of valleys, putative sites for nuclease activity. And this is actual real data here. This is T equals eight and 16 minutes post-infection. We saw one precise valley in the plea in the presence of ADI. And what was very interesting is that this site is actually the circularized junction. So the at P circularized junction that only forms once the plea excises, right? The first thing that happens is the plea jumps out of the chromosome, circularizes. That new site is the target for ADI activity. Now, we were a little bit perplexed um, because we were able to demonstrate that if you clone just the at P sequence, which we thought was sort of the necessary target site, into a strain that lacks the integrase that otherwise wouldn't make this site, ADI has no activity. So it wasn't just the formation of this at P target sequence that was required for ADI activity, but actually the um, ADI um, anti plea activity requires the plea integrase. Okay, so not just for formation of AT-P. Again, the plea integrase is a DNA binding protein with catalytic activity to cut DNA. Its job is to do so precisely, right? Its job is to precisely cut the DNA and then ligate it back together to allow for recombination to occur. And so what we were seeing was, was different than sort of just integrase mediated activity. We also had a clue from a really simple experiment, which was just co-expressing the proteins in Vibrio. What happens? ADI by itself, which is in pink, is not toxic to cells. So this is not what you would expect if this is a true nuclease on its own. The integrase also is not toxic to Vibrio on its own, again, because it's a precise nuclease. There's one attachment site, it's not gonna do anything. However, when you co-express those two proteins, you see really robust cellular toxicity. And we wanted to confirm that the cellular toxicity was associated with nuclease activity. So we took a microscopy-based approach. And you can see here that when either protein is expressed in Vibrio, you can see the outlines of the cells here by DIC. You can fluorescently stain the DNA and then do traces. And you can see these nice intact cells loaded with DNA. You co-express the proteins, the cells are intact. There's no DNA. Okay, so um, along with this assay, we also did a plasmid depletion assay to show that just ADI and integrase expressed in cells, if you introduce a plasmid with an attachment site on it, you get preferential degradation of that plasmid and not an empty vector control. So these two proteins alone are sufficient to mediate the site-specific degradation of the AT sequence. We presume that that um, specificity is being driven entirely by the integrase. So our model is actually that the integrase is um, the activity of the integrase is being modulated by this ADI protein. We suspect that there's a direct interaction between these proteins that then sort of turns the integrase on its head and now it aberrantly cleaves its own genome. Okay, so we, we have evidence that the, catal the catalytic activity um, of the integrase is required for this toxicity and nuclease activity. Um, and we were unfortunately unable to recapitulate this in vitro, but that's sort of the model um, of where things stand. So once again, when we think about sort of this mechanism and how this contributes to the diversification of pleas in nature, we once again see just like the ODN story that pleas can encode diverse um, mobility modules. So they all encode a large serine recombinase. They all have to respond to phage infection through excision and then subsequent uh, integration. But only a subset of the pleas are susceptible to ADI activity, and the other ones encode integrases that are resistant to its activity. Again, suggesting that this phage counter adaptation has helped to contribute to the diversification of pleas in nature. So, putting this together, um, always save a good complicated slide till the end of your talk, right? Good lesson. Um, so, here are the pleas. This is the actual MOV alignment of each of the pleas to so the DNA alignment here. The colors in purple represent DNA sequence that is conserved among all the pleas. And then the variable colors tell you that they match between particular pleas. So all of them encode this integrase, but it's a little hard to tell. This flavor of integrase is actually encoding a divergent protein than this one. What this does on the end is give you a host range. These ones are resistant to ADI. These are susceptible. These are resistant. Same with the ODN. So this helps us to sort of start to tease apart what could have driven the diversification of these pleas in nature? 
I will say that um, our understanding up to this point was that CRISPR-Cas was the magic bullet. That CRISPR-Cas, as long as there was a matching spacer, could target any plea. And this is a fully functional, can adapt CRISPR-Cas system. Um, so this, this seemed like the magic bullet for the phage. Um, we are engaged in ongoing collaborative efforts to continue to survey epidemic strains of Vibrio cholera and understand what emerging pleas are coming up and what, what ICP-1 is doing in response. And this was the picture um, from our recent publication that made me admittedly very nervous. And another reason to not be happy in 2020 is that plea went away. So um, I was a little bit like, uh-oh, you know, maybe another plea will come and how long will it take? My whole lab is, you know, a lot of our lab is dedicated to understanding the biology of this element. Um, fortunately for us in 2021, we saw the emergence of a new plea that has quickly emerged to dominate the epidemic landscape. So if this y-axis went up to 100%, that would be what's happening right now in Bangladesh. Every single epidemic strain um, has plea 11. This plea is really interesting. Um, and I'll just leave you with this teaser. It is not susceptible to CRISPR-Cas. It is not susceptible to ODN. It is not susceptible to ADI. So we do not have any ICP-1 isolates yet that can overcome this plea. And we're eagerly awaiting our next sort of shipment of stool samples to see what in nature the phage has done to overcome this new variant. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab. A lot of um, recently graduated and folks who have moved on contributed to this work, as well as my current students. Um, these, this work would not be possible without my collaborator in Bangladesh, Munir Alam, and then my collaborators for the CryoEM. I'd like to thank my funding, and I've left a few minutes for questions, hopefully. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanks, Kim. Uh, the, the number of layers and this sort of interactions are always fascinating. Uh, okay, so do we have any Zoom questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, here. All right, so we'll start with one from Zoom. Does it sound like this is on? Great, all right. Um, are you finding PLE outside Vibrio? Yeah, so we have mostly found pleas in Vibrio cholera. We do have a recent publication that hints at some similar um, satellites outside of cholera strains in Vibrio. So in Vibrio algonoliticus and I think Harvey um, it was the Nixai publication. We don't know what exactly to call them. We should be calling them pleas or not. <laughs> so we just said they're probably similar types of satellites, but the actual pleas, which we define by nucleotide similarity are restricted to Vibrio cholera. Awesome. Questions? Yeah, oh, plenty. Okay. All right. Hi, that was a great talk. I am thinking more about driving of evolution for please, right? So if you're thinking that you have Vibrio that is being infected by viruses and the plea is not working, is that plea then being expressed and then it's not working and then it's making its way into environment. So are other Vibrio pricking it up and learning that they need to adapt? Like, is there sensors? Ah, we're seeing this in the environment. We need to adapt ours because it's not working. Yeah, that's a good question. We, we certainly have no evidence of that. Um, all of the anti-plea mechanisms that we've studied also limit plea transfer during phage infection. So it's not as if the plea is still able to steal that structural machinery and then go on to propagate. Um, to the same extent that it normally would. Um, as far as other mechanisms promoting sort of the adaption or the adaptations of pleas, one thing we're really interested in is thinking out about how pleas may compete with one another. Um, we actually never see pleas co-resident in the same cell, which is a very strange observation that in other phage satellites, they do usually coexist in the same cell. So we think there may be some exclusion mechanisms. We haven't been able to see any evidence under laboratory conditions, but it's something that we're thinking a lot about as playing another role in sort of these variability and these changes we see in nature. Super cool. Yeah, great talk. Uh, are the plea integrases similar to any phage integrases that are known? No, no. <laughs> Most, most of the plea proteins are not similar to any other proteins. And the integrases are very clearly large serine recombinases, but not, not related to ones from pages that I know of anyway. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Sort of following up on the previous two threads then, um, do you have a sense of where these things come from? Like, are these, you know, integrative conjugative elements that sort of started to become like phage or are these, you know, prehistoric sort of phage things that started to become more like integrative conjugative elements? They seem to have such intimate knowledge of the phage replication mechanism. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in I would say that there's two major hypotheses about how these viral satellites emerge. And one is that they're decaying viruses that have lost essential components that now have to steal from other viruses. The other thought is that they're mobilizable elements that have gained the capacity to parasitize phages because, hey, what a great way <laughs> to get out of a cell, right? And protect yourself in that extracellular environment. So for please, what I was sort of hoping with this historical collection is we'd see some sort of evidence of either more gain of autonomous viral functions or, you know, something like that. We haven't seen that. All of the pleas that we have discovered all sort of rely on ICP-1 to the same extent, giving us no clue about if they were sort of decaying prophages or not. Excellent. We're about out of time. If there's one more quick one. Okay. Great, thank you so much, Kim. That was fantastic. Uh, so now um, we'll have Vivek Mutalik here from L in LBL. He will talk to us about uh, how high throughput investigation of virus host interactions. Thank you. Uh, thanks to be here, and I'm really ha happy to present the work that we are doing on some of the some of the stuff on phage and phage bacteria interactions. Um, my lab particularly focuses on microbial interactions, and uh, you know, understanding the mapping of these interactions so that we can start engineering some functional ecologies where these uh, interactions matter in applications, whether it is soil or uh, human health. Uh, particularly, I'll be focusing here on the phage angle, as usual, right in this conference. Um, so this is one of the key knowledge gaps that we have in microbial ecology is what is a sequence to function relationship. So a typical style is where they isolate microbes from different ecosystems, sequence them, use computational models to predict what are the gene function structure look like, build some flux analysis models, and then we make a you know, speculation of what must be happening in the nature. And one of the key gap here is the experimentally validated what is the function of these genes that we, these microbes encode. So for example, here, the blue is computationally predicted function and the gray part is no, it, there is no comparison to any data that is out there. So you cannot predict any function. Experimentally validated functions are in that green, uh, uh, in the green uh, color uh, pie. So this is from a thousand bacterial strain uh, published a decade ago. This has not improved uh, any further. So in fact, this is severely uh, compromised in com com when you compare it to phages. This is the uh, uh, complexity we have. So phages, obviously, we know they are everywhere. So we have heard enough talks about phages present in every environment we are associated with. However, the studies that we have known so far are on model, model organisms and model bacteria phage interactions, which is important, as we just heard from Kim Stock, phage infects and bacteria response. And this war has been going on for millions of years. So uh, thankfully, uh, untargeted metagenomics is giving a lot of diversity. What is the phage diversity looks like in the biosphere? This is the almost uh, five years ago, uh, published paper from JGI showed what is the diversity looks like Earth virome, where they predicted phage host interactions. But we know that this prediction of phage host interactions is not really perfect, and we need a lot of study on this. Um, obviously, the other, other knowledge gap in this is phage function, gene functions. So we don't have any uh, well systems understanding how do we associate the function to the gene. So obviously, largest, it's the largest diversity of the functions, which we don't know more than if you isolate a phage in a lab, it's a high chance that 80 to 90% of the genes, we do not make any, uh, we don't have the functions annotated in, by using the tools we have. Um, these unknown functions are challenging when you're trying to build ecosystem models and beyond that, you know, thinking of climate change and how phage is interacting soil health or human health and so on and so forth. Unless we understand those, at least to a level of 
uh, sense that it's, it's going to be challenging. So really, it also remits how we use these phages for different applications. Uh, and, and that is one of the things that uh, our lab works on. One example, concrete example, this is the Felix-01 phage, which actually um, um, infects, in fact, kills 98% of uh, more than 98% uh, of Salmonella species out there. And this is used for diagnostic purposes. But more than uh, 60 to 70% of the genes of this phage, which is used in diagnostics, is we still do not understand. So there's a lot of, lot of studies we can do uh, all lifelong. So what are the knowledge gaps that are driving our lab, particularly is understanding how, what are the different infection pathways uh, in different model systems? Uh, can we understand phage resistance mechanisms? If you want to understand it used for applications, we need to map that. Can we understand what is the phage host uh, range look like, or can we predict them? Um, and also interesting is the cross resistance. Can, how do I map these phages? When one phage infects, does the other phage is resistant to it? What are the trade-offs? Uh, what are the virulence factors, functional traits? or fitness or a tolerance to a metal is it gives a sensitivity to phage. So all of these trade-offs are interesting to study. And then obviously, uh, you know, we need tools to engineer them so that we can study them, we can understand the functions of these phages, and then overall, uh, how do they impact the microbiota? So my personal uh, moonshot is, can I, given a bacterial genome sequence, can I predict a phage just based on the sequence? And that's the, that's the long shot. I don't think so we are near anywhere near there, but it's, a, it's a, something which I keeps motivating myself towards. So today I'm just going to give you snippets of these three different things, uh, focusing on phage host interaction uh, generation technologies that we have used so far, uh, understanding the gene function, uh, and then also understanding how do we study, start, rapidly start mapping gene essentiality and phages so that we can start understanding how do we make these engineering applications a uh, reality. So the first one, um, so a uh, few, few years back now, we started developing these couple of technologies. I'm directly associated with a couple of them, but not all of them. So RBTNSIG is a, is a transposome uh, mutagenesis where insertion on the genome of a bacteria, you can have a barcode on it. Uh, I'll cover it in a minute. So essentially, once you map this barcode insertion on a genome, then you can use this for a variety of applications. A bunch of publications followed up with these technologies. CRISPR-I, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Essentially, inactive, catalytically inactive CAS systems can be used for uh, you know, gene uh, knockdowns, and you can use that application for a variety of things, understanding the gene functions. And then the third thing is a DubSeq, is essentially a overexpression library with the barcodes on them. So you take a bacterial genome, you chop it up, and you clone it in with the barcodes on them, and then you can use that as a pooled fashion. And this work is not my only lab. I collaborate with uh, two uh, labs here in Adam Arkin, Adam Doshbar. Uh, they are collaborating labs. And then a bunch of people uh, listed here who have been really uh, you know, pushed the limits of these technologies. I'm going to touch upon a couple of these technologies in a, some detail. But one of the key thing about these technologies is the barcodes on them. So if you have a pooled library of barcodes, either it is a loss of function or gain of function, then you can expose them to different condition, whether it's high metal, high salt, phage, antibiotics, you name it. You can take these 96 different conditions and then you can essentially pool the survivors. If you add antibiotic, most of them will die. Some of them will survive. Collect the survivors, collect the genetic material, and then you can do a simple barcode PCR. And then you collect that before and after. Then quickly start understanding who survived and what do they encode in a function. And these are pretty economical. Uh, you know, Each assay can cost you $10 and then you can really rapidly test this under different conditions. Um, just to, if you Google fitness browser, LBNL, this is the data that you will get. More than 70 to 80 different bacterial strains have been created a library. So you can take a library and then quickly put a phage of your choice and then identify the receptor that it binds to. So I'll touch upon some of the data here I'm showing, but it is a huge microbiology resource. If you're thinking of a milestone, this might be one of them in terms of microbiology. So the CRISPR I obviously uh, you know we can design CRISPR libraries. You can pull them on a chip. Twist can generate these libraries much cheaper now. You can put it in a strain of choice, and then you add a condition of interest, whether it is metal phage, and then quickly see the survivors, and then start to addressing uh, more. You know, screenings will give you more hypothe hypothesis-driven research later on. So the dual bi barcoded library or overexpression library starts with a simple, any DNA for that matter, whether it is a phage or a bacteria, you chop it into a small chunks and then you clone it in a double barcoded library. 
uh, these dual barcoded libraries here, uh, you insert the DNA in the between, and then you can essentially have a pool library. And then these libraries can be exposed to different conditions and you PCR the barcode again. So we have used this Dubseq library or or expression library for diverse conditions. I'm just showing a snapshot of the data here. This is the E. coli library expressed in E. coli and that library is exposed to different conditions. So I'm showing you different conditions on the X axis, uh, which shows different antibiotics, metals, uh, you know, so there are some other salts and some crazy stress conditions. And what you're looking at is the heat map and particularly focusing on, on the darker or a purple color, which gives you uh, survivor fitness. So if you have a deletion of a particular gene, the bacteria survives. And then you ask the question, why does it survive? Then you go and do the following experiments to validate. I'm showing you a snapshot of the genome browser there uh, where x-axis is a genomic locus and then y-axis is a score. The red are the fragments which survived nickel stress. And then we can quickly go and find out which gene is this. And it encodes a particular gene called RCNA, which is involved in nickel efflux pump. And you can see that when I express this pump, uh, it gives a resistance to nickel stress. So these kind of data that quickly uh, starts giving, you know, associate the genes to a function. So uh, how do we use these technologies for phages and understanding how the phage interactions mechanisms work and what are the rules of uh, infectivity pathways? So we used to have a proof of concept. Uh, this is a, a couple of years, two years back now published uh, in PLOS Bio. Essentially, we took 3D technologies and then we thought, okay, the, let's take 14 different phages in E. coli. Uh, these are well-studied phages. In fact, each of these phages have a chapter in a phage bacteriophage book. Uh, so you, there's a lot of information available. So we thought, okay, let's use these because there's so much is known. In fact, everything is known. So can we find um, any new thing or at least at least recapitulate what is known? So uh, experiment is simple. We take these pool libraries and then you add phage, different multiplicity of infection, and then you collect the survivors. And then you check the barcodes who survived this condition and then start understanding the receptors if it is possible. So this is a snapshot of data. So don't get boggled down by the information here, but I'm just access, X axis is a different phages at different concentration. Y axis is different genes. What we are looking at is a purple bar or a purple dark color, which gives the highest score. The yellow squares are the known data. So we validate what is known. So just to take up an example, for example, phage T4 here, uh, it's here. Uh, the receptor phage T4 uses is OMC. So if I delete OMC uh, is a porin, the phage cannot get in because phage needs OMC because phage releases the DNA through OMC. So if you delete a receptor and the bacteria survives, then you can quickly use this kind of screens to identify not only receptors, but also enzymes, which are important for other functions for a phage replication and so on. So this kind of a data gives quickly a fitness phenotype for a particular phage. So it also gives a resolution at a, at a LPS. LPS sugars are important, phages bind to LPS, and then it's always difficult to understand which gene is essential, which sugar moiety is important for phage infection. These technologies can quickly give you that resolution of possibility. So this is a gain of function technology where, where I'm expressing E. coli in E. coli, e. coli fragments in E. coli, and then exposing that to phage. And here we, you can see that one of the genes particularly giving resistance to all the phages, and then, um, you know, there are some other dark color. Uh, it, there's a lot of data possible, but this particular gene is involved in a production of a colonic acid. Essentially, when you overexpress this gene, uh, E. coli forms nice gooey structure around it. Uh, and so the, it in, interferes with the phage infection. Um, so, and then the second point here is the, the, these kind of new genes. So a gene, phage N4 is a, like a 50 year old, people have studied over decades now. In fact, we thought it's, it's, it's completely, uh, everything is known about this phage. Recently, it, it's realized that this is not unknown. More and more, more studies are coming out. So in fact, these genes are involved in degradation of cyclic DIGMP, which is involved in virulence, pathogenicity, you name it. This is a second uh, signaling mechanism. And now it is known that in fact, this phage binds to a different newly, uh, uh, new LPS, uh, EPS, uh, exopolysaccharide, and the cyclic DGMP is involved in the regulation of the phage receptor. So these kind of studies definitely give more information on that. So we followed up these studies with some of the validations to do whether overexpression of one particular gene, which is unknown function, 
or overexpression of some of these uh, degradation enzymes which are involved in phage receptors. So it, these results definitely in fact you know, it gives us a more economical way of quickly doing the screenings and understanding the mechanisms of infection. So what, what next, right? This is the equal study. Can we do it for non-model organisms? And that was the main focus of these technologies. So since then, uh, we have extended to salmonella strains. Obviously, these are all model strains still. We have published salmonella strain. Rest of these are all either soil microbes, portion, and also human gut microbiome and strain from human gut microbiome. And one of the things that we had to struggle with isolation of phages, of course, you can isolate phages from wastewater, but if you are isolating from a groundwater, the challenges are totally different. So we had to develop some uh, different ways of isolating different uh, phages for these kind of microbes. So we have also gone one level up. Can we really expand it more than this? So we have obviously, as any lab would do, we extended to droplet technologies. Now each droplet has a bacterial barcoded bacterial strain. And each droplet will also have a phage. So you have a very um, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of an interaction within the droplet. After incubation, you break the droplet, you collect the survivors and do the bar seek. And these kind of experiments are so rapid that it is just, we need to imagine what can we do with these kind of technologies next. We have also extended to something for which we had never thought of doing it, is trying to understand how the phage infection is impacted by the metal conditions, abiotic condition, in this case, alkali metal conditions. And these ones, um, Hans Carlson has a scientist in albinol. He has carried out this crazy experiment where we have more than 80 different inorganic ions and how they impact phage infection. In fact, we see that in absence of phage, the IC50s are lower. That means phage gives protection to bacteria in uh, extreme um, uh, environmental conditions. We're trying to untangle that in a, in a follow-up studies, but this, this gives a, a, the scale of things can be done. So you know how, where we are going with this. We have the phage resistance landscape or fitness landscape. We can do the similar things for different conditions. This I'm showing for different antibiotics, but you can do it for metals, preservatives, pesticides. And now once you have these kind of landscape, then you can think about putting that together. And then you can start one on the, one on the other and then start, to start trying to predict. Can we see the trade-offs when the phage resistance happens? What are these other things give me sensitivity or the other way around? You know, when this is sensitive, can I have a more, more phage resistance and can we use it for detection tools? So quickly snap, uh, cover the summary on this, that obviously we can do these all technologies, not in all the microbes. We need to have genetic tools for that bacteria. Then we can use that for making libraries and studying them. And then obviously gives the infection. Most important thing is this kind of data gives resolution for predictive model building so that we can start building these phage host interactions at a level which is not possible currently. The so second uh, quick snippet is on the phage functional roles. Uh, one of the things that you have heard this, the diversity of phages is so huge that we can't really comprehend how much information is there. So one of the example is a single strand RNA and DNA phages. The number is, I'm completely lost the numbers now. I think more than 20,000 different single strand RNA phages are assembled. We don't even know who they infect. We don't even know what do they do. Uh, but so mechanism of action is, is important, but also one of the key uh, unknown in this is the location of this lysis gene. These are three gene phages, very small, three to five KB gene. And the lysis gene is all over the place. So there is no real fixed location of this lysis gene. So there is a maturity, maturity protein, port protein, and the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So one of the key thing about this is lysis protein is super important because it Imagine these 20,000 different phages infecting bacteria and they, they must be targeting something which is different from DNA phages. DNA phages have a more than four to five different proteins involved in lysis, whereas the single strand RNA phages, one protein carries that function. So they are also called as protein antibiotics. The way they do this function is because of interfering with the peptidoglycan biosynthesis. I'm showing an example of this uh, levivirus M here, which interferes with the flipase, lipid, a, lipid 2 flipase called merge. This, if you interfere this, uh, the phage or the bacteria completely uh, dies. And how, if by identifying these kind of targets, we can start thinking about protein antibiotics, which can be useful for uh, the next generation. So this work is in collaboration with Adam and Ryang, who Ryang is a, uh, is a, is a em eminent scientist in this field, particularly single strand RNA phages and lysis uh, systems. And Ben Adels is a grad student in UC Berkeley and is now postdoc in Doudna Lab. Uh, here we took six different single strand RNA phages. These are 
well studied phages, but we still do not know what these lysis genes target to. We took these lysis genes and then we cloned them in a vector. And when we express this lysis gene, cell dies. In presence of DubSeq library, which is an overexpression library, we can collect the survivor. So what happens here is you are inducing the lysis gene and then you are delivering a suppressor possibility and you can survive, collect the survivors and you can check who survived this particular lysis gene and you can quickly map the resistance phenotype there. So this data gives one of the satisfactory thing is identifying, okay, this uh, single gene uh, protein M from a, a lysis M, it, in, it particularly gives suppressor of merging. And we found out a suite of genes which are involved in this kind of roles, uh, particularly is this PP7, which is a pseudomonas aeruginosa phage. And this particular lysis gene also um, you know, targets merge, which is interesting because these two uh, PP7 and M are completely different sequence-wise. They are, do not match uh, you know, sequence-wise, but the target is similar. So this kind of a, a convergence of functional conversion of particular target is interesting. And we might have to um, you know, ask this question, if there are 20,000 different single strand RNA phages, or more, they must be targeting something which is on the peptidoglycan like or outer membrane. So there must be a con functional convergence in all of them. And this would be interesting uh, study coming up next. And then the final thing I wanted to touch upon is how do we map these uh, functions of genes and how they, what are, the, what are the infection mechanisms are impossible and asking this question, can we use them for applications? So these are the well-studied phages in E. coli, Lambda and T4. They have decades of work, hundreds of thousands of people worked on it, mapping each of them, at least some of them, uh, what are the genes functions of them. And still we do not have a complete picture of these. Um, but you know, these kind of approaches are awesome, but we cannot, if thinking about the number of phages we have discovering every day, can we really think about something more scalable? Uh, and why do we need these kind of approaches? You know, I've just listed some of them, you know, conditional essentiality is pretty cool question to think about. If you're thinking of a genomic organization, why are things organized this way? Or can we have a minimal genome? Can we use it for applications? What are the host comp uh, compensating genes? And can we, how do we design these things better so that we can use it for diagnostics or human health or animal health, you name it, right? Um, so one of the things that we started with was, uh, you know, obviously this field has gone crazy with number of CRISPR systems coming up. We have nine, 12, 13, uh, I lost the number. But essentially, uh, nine and twelve target DNA dependent, and whereas uh, targeting DNA targeting CRISPR systems, Cas13 is RNA one. Uh, Danish is a Danish was a postdoc in the lab, and Madeline was a, a tech in the lab who developed this method where Cas12 um, in a plasmid, a DCas12, which is a catalytically inactive Cas12, with the guide RNA targeting different genes on a phage, can give a simple screen of you know if if the gene is essential you will not get any plus because the phage is going to you know, collapse. If the gene is not essential for phage infection and if you target with CRISPR, you will see the plus. So essentially this gives a simple yes and no kind of a mapping. So we did wanted to see whether this works well. Uh, so we, uh, we chose two different phages, which we have enough data, which can validate things are working okay and nothing is crazy. So we chose lambda and P1 phages. Uh, you know, we have about 67 genes, and then P P1 has about 117 genes uh, encoding proteins. So here we wanted to confirm, okay, these things work fine. We, so we 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 tried with a couple of uh, no major capsid protein is the essential gene for a phage. If you don't have a capsid, phage does not form. So lambda has E and no one. These are these are essential genes for lambda. So if you target them, phage you know cannot replicate well. Whereas P1 has got capsid protein packaging and then other proteins which are essential uh, are, if you target them, P1 cannot be successful, successfully formed. Whereas these are the unessential, uh, non-essential like you know, proteins, which are called protein phosphatase and some unknown function genes. So we are satisfied with this. We wanted to scale it up. So, you know, having a um, design well-known and having a Doudna lab next door helps much of many things. So for example, we knew the PAM sites for this, we designed guide RNA for each gene for each of these phages, cloned them in, and then transformed it to a bacterial strain. And then you expose it to different, the different concentration of phage, and then you collect the survivors or check the plaques and essentially calculate. So the following figure shows uh, you know, months of work mapping each gene, what is the, in triplicates, whether they are essential, non-essential, 
So I'm showing you uh, just a you know summary data, which is uh, red one is essential genes, whereas the green ones are non-essential genes, and some of them are not tested because they didn't have PAM site on them. So overall, uh, you know, out of 67, we have about 61 targeted. Uh, you know, our data matches more than 90% of them because we have the data which helps in validating some of them. And there are some ribosome profiling data shows that it has got another 55 genes, which we obviously we didn't target in this study. This is the P1 page, uh, which the organization is totally different as you can see. There are small patches of non-essentiality genes and some of the essential genes. And this kind of a data uh, is super cool because you can start understanding which genes are important, but not super essential, not uh, essential and you know, those kind of things. And also uh, this data is interesting. Out of 117, we see that about more than 95% of the data that we have with a single guide RNA, we will be able to map, map with the essentiality of this page. So what do we do with these kind of mapping, right? The next thing is what is the user, use of these kind of mapping and how do we use that application? So I'm showing three different snippets we have followed up, but I'm just going to touch upon one of them is we can use the non-essential parts for doing interesting things. You can put your interesting payload. We have used barcoded phages. We insert a barcode so that we can track them in the different conditions. We can put different genes which can cause burden for a cell, or we can use it for more functional genomics approaches, complementation and so on and so forth. So barcode phages, just uh, touch upon how do we use it for barcoded phages. Imagine having a patient pool and we want to treat them with different phages. You can have a different barcoded phages. You can change the formulation without any issue because your downstream processing is gonna be similar. You can barcode PCR, quantify which barcodes are performing well, which barcodes are not performing well. You can quickly start addressing quality control, whether it is following which phages to attract how the treatment efficiency is, what is the bioavailability of phages. You don't have to have design primers for every phage that you're thinking of using. So we use, use that for uh, P1 phages and lambda phage. We have done some follow-up studies with a pair of them. Seems reasonable, we're following in publication for this uh, in a couple of months. Just to summarize this part, you know, CRISPR-I definitely enables this kind of rapid, quick uh, screen uh, or assay, uh, identifying gene essentiality. We can you know, use this genome data for a lot of interesting um, studies, whether it is a fitness or a uh, you know, functional uh, analysis of this. One of the loopholes of CRISPR-I is the polar operon effects. Imagine the downstream gene is essential. So if you're shutting down the upstream gene, then the, the, the screen is not going to work. So having that kind of an, uh, you know, uh, information at the prior would be helpful, but otherwise you should always critically check what data is there. Obviously, we have not screened all the design parameters. There's so much to be done in terms of design space there. Um, but we are exploring a couple of these options. Barcoding definitely helps in standardizing the workflow or also quality controlling your page stocks in the lab or in the hospital and so forth. But the real star are these guys. You know, These guys are the real threat to the next generation. These are some of these strains are really XDR. They cannot be treated with any antibiotic out there uh, whether you look at the nature, uh, whether it is in, a, in a Pakistan or you know, uh, for India or UK, these, some of the strains are extremely resistant to all the antibiotics out there. So single labs doing any of these phage therapy or any of these things are, is an awesome initiative, but it's not going to scale. What we need is a really holistic uh, treatment entire community coming together. So we put together this white paper in iScience in, uh, uh, this year about the phage foundry format. I think we need a more systematic approach. If we're thinking of this whole phage community is not some bubble, everything is being shared. We know that, we saw that today in morning, that things are being shared. Imagine these antibiotic resistance genes passing through all the things that we handle, or you know, whether it is the hospitals or you know, industrial meat production or food production. So the things are gonna be pretty nasty if we're thinking of bioterrorism agents and so on and so forth. So we need to be ready for, uh, you know, it's not like a sales pitch or anything. It's a reality now. Um, so we, we put together this systematic workflow and, uh, you know, it's a huge goal. If we have a systematic surveillance of the environments and then we can have the more systematic phage and host characterization facility, not all the labs will have the technology or the money or the you know, power or facility to carry out these experiments. So you need a more foundational facility where these can be done, whether it is characterization, engineering, and so on and so forth. You need more knowledge-based sharing. Right now, there is literally less um, other than sequence data. Literally nothing is being shared between phage researchers, for example. So we need this 
page foundry knowledge base where things are stored or at least shareable so that people can learn and understand from each other so that we can start think about really start making rational cocktails engineered phages for a variety of applications and so on and so forth so take a take a look at this this is not a finished product it's evolving and obviously this is just a white paper for you know stimulate the you know uh, the field so we call upon you know really we need more systematic surveillance we need sampling isolation methods and we need more advanced characterization we need long term investments it can't be less one patient or one facility or one application we need more much more stronger full uh, you know look at the whole road anyway so many people to thank i just want to uh, blue, blue names in blue uh, letters are, are the people who are directly involved in most of the data that generated by them uh, and then i'm thankful to all the collaborators and i know thanks for your time All right, does it sound like this is on? Yay. Yeah, this is actually a small question about the droplet experiments. Yeah. How are you getting single phage particles into droplets? Oh yeah, yeah, single phages are not going to be controllable, but bacterial strains are. We have a single barcode, single or more than uh, one or zero or four bacterial strains. And the phages are going to be at different dilutions. Obviously, we can't control the number of phages per okay. droplet. So you're but using like a probability distribution. Yeah, exactly. For, got it. So okay. we, we think the range is more than 100 MOI. Okay. Like one bacteria versus hundreds of phages. Got it. Obviously, we, yeah, we tried different dilutions, but that much more 100 is more than better. Okay, thanks. That's a great question. Fantastic. Wonderful talk, Vivek. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So next up, we have Ivan Liashko from Phase Genomics. And all right, take it away, Ivan. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for staying. I'm the last speaker, so I'll try to keep it pretty quick. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, so I, I run a small company in Seattle called Phase Genomics. And what I'll do today is I'll tell you guys about the technology. Some of you have worked with us before, but for those of you who haven't, um, I'll introduce our tech. I'll show some published, unpublished data, some of our projects. And then at the end, I have sort of a call out for a new project we're doing for which we're looking for collaborators. So um, the problem that we're trying to resolve is, uh, is one that's very known to everyone in the audience, has been addressed by lots of speakers. The fundamental problem that when you are dealing with any kind of metagenomic sequencing, you extract DNA, at which point it all gets mixed and you lose a lot of valuable information. And of course, one of the, um, one of the casualties of shotgun metagenomics is that if you have mobile elements like phages, like plasmids, other things, um, you, you sort of lose the contiguity, their connection to the genome where they came from. Right, and there's all sorts of other problems. Right, You're trying to recreate genomes for multi-chromosomal organisms is extremely difficult. Strain deconvolution, all these sorts of things. And so, um, so we've harnessed a sequencing trick that was originally designed for something else. This is a technology called proximity guided. Uh, so it's it's called proximity ligation. Some of you have heard of it. Call it high C. You guys saw Yuna's awesome talk. That was an example of it. So. Uh, it was originally developed to look at three-dimensional folding of the genome. And the way it works is you basically take um, cells, you, fi you fix them with formaldehyde, you treat them with formaldehyde, and what that does is it goes inside the cells and it creates physical connections, basically covalent junctions between uh, molecules that are physically next, together, next to each other, right? And what that does is it traps in physical space DNA sequences that are uh, next to each other, which you can then basically recover and create this, this um, proximity ligation, it's a little bit like uh, if you ever tried cloning a plasmid, right? And you want the plasmid to ligate stuff, but it wants to close on itself. That's basically what proximity ligation is. DNA sequences that are close together are preferentially gonna ligate. And then we can, then what, it, what that does is it creates these, um, 
these chimeric junctions. And so then you sequence this red blue chimeric junction and you know that whatever the red sequence is on the left and whatever the blue sequence is on the right, they were physically close to each other in three dimensional space, right? And this is what's used to do the 3D modeling that HiC is known for. Uh, but remember, the, the cross-linking happened at the very beginning of the experiment before you broke the cells, right? So these junctions happened inside the cells. And so whenever you have uh, two sequences that are physically interacting by this assay, they must have started out inside the same cell at the beginning of the experiment, right? So if we have a metagenome, right, um, you will get junctions both intra and interchromosomally, right? You'll get physical connections between the same chromosome and between different chromosomes. And that'll tell you sort of which sequences started out inside the same cells. And so you can use that to deconvolve metagenomes. And importantly, the junctions don't, they're all not just inside the same chromosome, you also get ones between them. So if you have a plasmid or a phage, it'll cross link to the genome of the host and you, you can actually connect mobile elements to their host at the same time. So uh, we've shown a number of ways. So one of the things that this does, this trick, it allows you to basically supercharge your mag binning, right? So when you're doing, when you're deconvolving metagenomes, right? You're trying to use tetranucleotide frequency, coabundance, these sorts of things. Now you have another piece of information, which is which contigs have been touching each other, right? Which ones came in, out of the same cell? And so that sort of supercharges your ability to create sort of high complex, sort of high contiguity, high accuracy mags. We have a platform for doing this called Proximeta. It's really good for getting into that dark matter of the microbiome because it doesn't require uh, sort of databases. It just says contig A, contig B, we're touching each other, put them into the same mag. Um, but the other thing is more relevant, I think, for this, um, for this conference is we've shown as well as uh, other labs that you can, tr you can connect mobile elements to their hosts at the same time as you're doing this mag binning, right? So the same data set can be used to basically on the left here, we're talking about antibiotic resistance and plasmid genes. And then uh, a group at, uh, in Paris showed uh, back in 2017, you can do this with viruses and phages as well. So, right, so here's your mags that you've assembled. And then here are antibiotic resistance genes, right? So what's cool is it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one relationship. So if you have a stripe like this, that means whatever this gene is, it's touching all these different hosts, right? And if you have a stripe going across, that would tell you that, um, you know, I don't know, let's say this one here where you can see blocks going this way, that would tell you that um, this particular host contains all these different AMR genes. So you can detect multi-drug resistance, you can detect plasmid host range and things like that, that uh, sort of broad host range type uh, mobile elements. And the same thing with phages, right? You can place them to their host without any culturing, without having to do, um, you know, without having to do any isolation. And so then we pushed, the, uh, we pushed it a little bit one step further. The idea is that if you, you can, you, can, you can say, okay, this is a phage contig, which mag does it belong in? Who is it touching? But if you have two contigs in the metagenome that are both, they both seem to be viral. And if they're touching each other and they're also touching the same bacterial host, that argues that they're probably part of the same phage. 